So we are at our June information exchange meeting where we'll be talking about safeguarding. What is it and why does it matter? Our ground rules are, we'll ask you to mute your microphone when you're not speaking, to respect each other's views and opinion, and not to say or do anything that will make you feel uncomfortable. I hope this is fine with everyone. And now I will, uh, we have three speakers today. Uh, our community champions, Christine <coughs> Wellington and Elspeth Williams, but I think Elspeth will take some time for her to join. And we have John Binding, the head of safeguarding in Hackney. Christine and, and Elspeth will um, introduce themselves as well. Christine, it will be really useful if you quickly say what is your role within the community and then move to um, giving information about what is safeguarding and what are the signs of abuse and neglect. And then we'll pass on to John Binding. Wonderful. Thank you, Thank so, you very much. Hi, everyone. I've, um, it's a pleasure to join you. I, I must say that um, I was involved in getting uh, community and voluntary organisations to think about safeguarding. Um, so over the last seven or so years, I've had the privilege of sitting with colleagues like John and his predecessors, being part of the City and Hackney Safeguarding Adult Board, and really assisting voluntary and community organizations to embrace their safeguarding responsibilities. I'm gonna also share that Lola who's sitting on the call was part of that journey. Hi Lola, nice to see you. Um, and so this conversation is just part of the picture. Um, and it's great to be able to share that I am no longer physically in the bar of working. I'm taking some of the great work that we've done in Hackney into Brent, where is my, my new post. And I'm still supporting colleagues in Hackney as they continue their really, really good work. So it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, before we get into this scenario, I know that uh, it's courtesy for us to just plow in with the speakers. I'd love to know which, who the audience is that I'm addressing today. It'd be really good to have a flavor of, of the people that are here. Um, how many have we got on the, on the call? 18, 18 people, Christine. 18. And it's so a mixed pack of members. Yeah, of the public so I can do that really simply. Um, so in terms of testing your ability to use the chat function, tell us um, just, indicate with a thumbs up if you attend any community organizations first of all do you attend a faith group a lunch club um, a care facility a, a, a group that brings religious groups together women's groups etc thumbs up so elspeth's here wonderful so donald as well excellent so several people excellent so the first thing to share that any organizations that you um, have the privilege of um, going to, being a member of, they should have a safeguarding policy for adults. And the question is whether it's on their website, whether you um, have seen it, and if you, you know about it. Um, so that's the first thing, they should have a policy which is all about safeguarding adults. If they work with children, they'll also, never as part of the same one, also have a policy about safeguarding children. So that's the first thing. The second um, aspect of this is there should be a named safeguarding lead on a A4 sheet or when you go into the building, you should see somebody who's absolutely named, the go-to person. If you have a concern about an adult being abused or if you've got a concern about an individual or for yourself, you should know the safeguarding lead. So back to those organ those individuals, Donald, Jenny, Wing, um, do you know who the safeguarding lead is in those organizations? <gasps> got a bit of homework. So Kanara, they've got homework already. You've got homework already. So whether you go to your GP, so you may not have that in the public, in, you may not attend a community organization, but if you go to your GP, there will be a safeguarding lead. If you go to the police, there'll be a safeguarding lead. If you go to the fire brigade, any public service. So on the City and Hackney Safeguarding Adult Board, there's representatives from the statutory sector and the voluntary sector. So there's a duty to protect adults in need. So that's the first thing that you should know. So even the GPs, when you go to, to see a GP 
or the dentist. I go to my dentist, they say, Christine, safeguard and training is boring, we do it to tick a box because we have to, there's a statutory duty. So um, what we try to do in the community is recognize that safeguarding can be laborious. I'll leave that to you, John. Think, why is it relevant to us? Not only in our working life, in our daily life. The first thing we say is safeguarding is everyone's responsibility. Can you say that with me? Even if you're on silent, just come off mute. Safeguarding is everybody's responsibility. It's important, um, safeguarding is, is so important because the first people to see safeguarding concerns are often the individuals that are closest to the adult. And when I'm thinking about adults, I'm thinking about adults um, who are at, at working age, um, up to people who, you know, before you come to your end of life. So I'm not talking about children, I'm talking about adults, um, age 18 and over. And there is a transition age, we talk about children being in transition to adults from 16, 17, 18 and, and upwards. Um, but it's really important that safeguarding is understood as everybody's responsibility, because very often the, the individuals closest to their family, friends, neighbours can see changes in individuals that others do not see. And so one of the things that is important about safeguarding is to notice what's changed. Are they behaving differently? Do, what do we see? What do we hear? What do they say that tells us that there's a safeguarding concerns? Um, so what we've done in the community is to ensure that voluntary and community organizations understand their duty of care to safeguard those in need. So the journey that we've been on is asking community organizations to be safeguarding champions, to ask community organizations to think about what they see and to understand when they need to make a referral to the adult safeguarding board, when they need to identify there's a concern about a service users that needs to be overseen and monitored by a lead within their organization, the safeguarding board. So this is important. Now, some, some individuals and communities that we've worked with, faith groups, community, grassroots community organizations, service providers that are commissioned, they may say, but aren't we whistleblowing? Aren't we telling other people? Um, aren't we sort of blowing the whistle and telling other people and getting somebody in trouble, the perpetrator in some cases in trouble, or we're actually, we're not sure live on a housing and we see maybe a young person in the playground and we think that person's always there 11 o'clock at night and they're surrounded by individuals and the behavior doesn't seem to be appropriate. We're thinking, well, well I'm not gonna interfere. But actually, what you might be seeing is what we call C, sexual exploitation abuse. And you might be seeing it and observing it and be concerned about it, but you think, it's nothing to do with me, I want to pass it on to others. What we try and do is encourage organisations to, to share that responsibility. If you see something, say something, take it to the individuals that are concerned. So what we offer in the, in the safeguarding session is an opportunity, uh, Elspeth and 14 other colleagues, uh, an opportunity to discuss some of the concerns that are seen at community level for 90 minutes. So the sessions at last just 90 minutes for you to have an overview. What is the DNA, if you like, uh, for this particular estate, for this particular faith group, for this particular lunch club? Are we seeing adults that may be at risk of financial abuse? Uh, what do we do about some of these concerns that may prop up? Um, there's an opportunity and very often people shy away. I'm not sure it's nothing to do with me, but as I said at the start, safeguarding is everybody's responsibility. So that's a bit of, a, of, of an overview. The offer is a 90 minute um, session to voluntary and community organizations, to volunteers, to discuss some of those challenges, to discuss the DNA. What I mean by that is what is the blueprint? If you've got a particular target audience, there are some safeguarding issues that you might need to be concerned about. If you're talking about young people in that transition to adulthood, they may be at risk because they're going through changes as they enter adult life. They may be people who are at a working age of, of a working age population. And they may be going through multiple stresses because we're, we're living with the pandemic. Or you may have, elderly members of the community who are isolated because they haven't got relatives who live close by 
and they may be on their own. They may have you know, early long-term health conditions that have additional safeguarding concerns. You might have somebody like I know, an individual who suffers from sickle cell and they're in and out of hospital. What's happening to their property? Could that be abused while they're away? While they're away? Um, what could be happening to them in terms of being in, in a hospital setting? So there's a whole range, but the benefit is that we have a community approach to safeguarding. Um, community organizations are able to raise alerts for significant issues Issues, such as hoarding. Um, if hoarding's at a significant level, actually you might be able to refer that to the safeguarding board as an issue around self-neglect. Um, Christine, just wait a couple assistance. of more minutes because we'll have to get yep, some no, questions I've from got, the public as well. I'm going to jump through my Prezi. I'm going to jump through my Prezi. Um, so what I wanted to share with colleagues today was just for them to have an understanding of some of the core areas of, of abuse and for you to conceptually think about what your role is as a member, as a friend, family or neighbour and that's what we've adopted, the friends, family and neighbours approach to safeguarding and just thinking about what types of abuse would be of particular concern to your community. Now John's going to deal with all of the acts and, 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 and the legislation, we just want to prompt your awareness. So I'm going to hand over to Elspeth, who's going to um, in, uh, do her little bit about thinking of the areas of abuse. Now, normally in the session, we don't give it away how many areas of abuse there are. Uh, there are there are 10, and Elspeth's going to tell you how you can recall what those 10 are. Elspeth, take it away. Are you ready? Okay, yep. Yeah. I'm going to be uh, very uh, quick. Normally, I uh, go around. And... Sorry? Oh, no, no, I said thank you. All right, okay. Yeah, normally I'd go around and um, ask uh, for individual response uh, as part of the enjoyment of training and whatever else have you. But um, yeah, as we're presenting very quickly. Um, so first of all, there are 10 areas, uh, well, 10 main categories of abuse, but there, you know, there are a lot more, but sort of 10. So the first one is um, physical abuse. And that's, you know, like a spitting, uh, hitting and all sorts of different, you know, things around that. And then our next one is emotional abuse. And all, also um, with that, you know, it's, a, you know, like a gaslighting and uh, things like that. So if uh, people aren't aware of what gaslighting is, it's uh, almost uh, making somebody think that they're losing their mind when they're not. Um, that's just a, a very quick example of emotional abuse and also um, coercive behavior and uh, you know making people but basic basically taking away people's will and um, not treating them right and then you've got neglect and um, signs of omission and that basically um, is when you don't do something so it's not necessarily about you um, doing something to somebody um, it may be the fact that you're actually missing out essential things that they need when um, you know so that's neglecting or omitting to do that. And then we also then have um, sexual abuse. So there's physical sexual abuse as well, but what a lot of people don't realize as well is um, the use of sexu sexual language as well is also um, a problem, um, you know. So with those four, or should I say, uh, yeah, those four, we've um, had an acronym and that is, um, P-E-N-S, so that's PENS. And that's also one way of you sort of um, being able to remember what they are. So that's physical, emotional, neglect, and sexual. So then um, we also have a standalone thing, which uh, also uh, a lot of people with uh, financial abuse. And so that's, you know, like um, it could be, you know, taking people's, um, money um without their consent so like um maybe filling in filling in forms getting them to sign things when they're not quite aware of what they're signing it could be maybe getting them to do their things online so that you can access their accounts online so there's you know there's cyber safety there's quite a few things going into financial and um you know it's also around making sure that you know uh, the use of um things like 
vouchers and all of that sort of stuff is um, also um, not not because um, you feel that it's not cash. A voucher is also um, part of financial abuse, as is uh, when people are buying stuff and um, getting them free. So then we are now going to go into um, situations, um, or I will always say like locations of um, abuse. So we've got the, the first one, which is um, modern day slavery. And, uh, you know, that, that, you know, can come in many forms, uh, even like with bringing relatives um, from abroad, maybe to do a lot more work than um, what they should be doing. And, you know, uh, basically um, having them in um, servitude. And then also as well, um, having them maybe working for very, very minimum uh, minimum, be way below minimum wage and whatever else have you. And we've also um, seen things uh, with that, with people coming from abroad in lorries and, you know, also, um, you know, what have happened to those people that have been sort of um, literally um, treated like animals and, and brought over here by that. So then we also have uh, organisational abuse and um, we tend to think of care homes and uh, all of those sort of things as well, you know, that where abuse can take place. But I think um, sometimes um, some housing, uh, you know, like supported housing uh, with their acts of omission and not really sort of uh, coming across like that as well. People are slightly unaware that, you know, they have a duty of care to um, their uh, clients and they, will tend to maybe sometimes uh, do what's easier, but then at the same time, if it's detrimental to the client, um, it's something that also, I, um, you know, needs to be reported um, as, it, because that is actually organizational abuse if they're omitting to do things that they should be doing. So then we also then have um, domestic abuse. And that um, has been obviously changed from domestic violence because it's not just about um, somebody um, physically hitting you. So then you see that's um, physical coming into, you know, the household. It's about, not about somebody physically hitting you. It's also about somebody emotionally um, abusing you in your home as well, you know, and cohesive behavior and gaslighting and all of that sort of stuff in your domestic situation. Then we come on to um, discriminatory abuse. And with that, that basically is you know, around people's sort of protective characteristics um, and other things as well uh, come into that. But um, one of the easier things uh, for me to sort of bring on is like hate crime, being part of the domestic abuse and, you know, like around uh, people and their disabilities. So basically um, treating somebody in um, a very unfriendly and um, abusive way if they, you know, say for example, they have a learning disability and you feel that, um, you know, uh, you can take advantage of them and they have to do what you say because they have a learning disability and you treat them quite badly and take their money. So that's, you know, um, even though it's a discriminatory um, abuse, it's still showing that, you know, physically, um, you know, like you can probably physically hurt them, uh, sexual, uh, the use of sexual language, uh, you know, may upset them and things like that. And they, it's their right um, to be treated in the way that they want to be treated as well. So that's just an example of um, domestic abuse. Then we also have um, the last one, which is self-neglect. And so with self-neglect, okay, um, it's you are admit, omitting yourself um, not to do um, certain things. So then, you know, like um, maybe getting up and not taking your medication, not cleaning yourself properly, um, you know, and then also the big one of hoarding. So with that one, um, that would have actually made that last section was M-O-D-D-S. And that makes uh, mods. So um, to remember um, the categories, and um, this is, um, pens and then you've got financial and then you've got mods and all of this actually was um uh christine um uh, we have to give her some credit for that and other people that worked with her for um finding this and it makes it very easy for us all to remember you know um the categories and uh also as a, a community champion 
I do uh, safeguarding training and anybody out there that wants any safeguarding training for myself and the other champions, um, yeah, please, please feel free to, um, you know, uh, come in, it's uh, free. And um, yeah, we're always happy and I'm always happy to um, take it on. And thank you all so much. Uh, and sorry for not making it participatory, uh, participatory but um, yeah, thank you all. And yeah, thank I think we'll be open to questions now. Thank you very much. Before we go on, sorry, I'm going to just round up. So colleagues, this is a real whistle stop tour. Um, John and his team have done some brilliant work around case studies, and that's how you really learn to apply safeguarding in different contexts. That's absolutely key. There's lots of data on the website. The most important thing, for, uh, the aspect of safeguarding for me is about making safeguarding personal. So the Care Act 2014 really drives home the importance. Two messages that I love, which have been long. One, don't treat people as vulnerable adults because there's a tone that, oh, they can't do for themselves, so you sort of have to do for them. That's disempowering. I still hang on to the empowerment approach. And the other aspect of that is about making safeguarding personal. What does the individual want? How do we respond to that individual need? Um, and we spend time on the program really thinking and reflecting what are your roles and responsibilities as friends, family or neighbours or as members of the community. So this is just a brief overview and there's time for you to reflect and I hope you agree with us that safeguarding is everyone's responsibility. Over to Catherine. And over Thank to you very much, uh, Christine and, and Elspeth. That was uh, brilliant. And we will share your details with anyone who wants to get in touch with you after the session today. I'll, I'll hand it over to John now. I'll, pre, I'll, I'll put up your presentation, John. And after John's presentation, we will open the session for questions and answers. Okay. That's great. So thank you, Kaniara. Just want to add to, I'm, so I'm John Binding. I'm the Head of Adult Safeguarding for Hackney Council. So thank you for this opportunity to come and talk to you about adult safeguarding. It's a kind of passion of mine, and I could talk happily for hours in relation to adult safeguarding. But the moment you give me about 20 minutes, so I'll capture some of what I would regard as, as the basics and well, what Kanira asked me to, to kind of focus on. So I want to talk a little bit around how to report a safeguarding concern, what information is generally needed, and, um, and what happens next. So I've got my own little thing here to guide me through. So obviously this will be available for you all anyway, and in theory should be in some of your policies and procedures where you work in terms of who to contact. Just before you continue, John, can I make yeah. sure that everyone can see the screen and the presentation? Okay, excellent, thank you. Is that good? Sorry, John, right. yes. So referrals received by, uh, generally in, in Hackney, we have a, a, a kind of single point of contact really for all adult safeguarding concerns. And they would come into the information and assessment team, which you'll often hear referred as the, um, the, the council's front door. And they would do an initial triage. It might be to identify if that person is known to us already, and they would forward that to a team that might uh, currently be involved. That might include somebody known to mental health services, for example. So the uh, information assessment team would, would do the initial receiving of it. And they're available on the numbers there. Um, and obviously there's an out of hours number. because We don't all shut up shop at five o'clock, nothing happens. So there is contact details for out of hours. Um, quite often nowadays, I think probably more so nowadays, we'll get uh, referrals or, or information because they don't always come in a lovely little reform, <laughs> referral format. Sometimes people tell us things as, as they're best able to communicate with us. So we'll have a lot of information that will come through email. And the email address there is adultprotection at hackney.gov.uk. We made that really simple. It's adult protection, so it's quite easy to find. Also, we do find there's another way of um, doing a, refer a referral form is through the City and Hackney Safeguarding Adults Board have a form on their website. I've included the website there or how to, to make contact. We're in the process of updating some of the, the council's um, mechanisms. And what we're about to do is do what some other boroughs have got, which you can enter um, a referral online and it will just automatically go to the team. We're kind of reviewing that. And as soon as we get some confirmation of that being okay, I'll make sure that's circulated with everybody. 
But I always put this into any kind of presentation that I do in relation to adult safeguarding. Remember that in an emergency, always call 999. And that's really important because sometimes, you know, there, there's one thing to bear in mind, the local authority, you know, our, our role is to gather information, but we're, we're not the police. And it's really important if you see something happening that you think somebody's in serious harm, call 999, make sure that they do that. So the next bit, that's okay, let's move on. That's great. So the next bit, what information is needed? Now I'm really conscious because in, in my view, what we kind of want from a, a safeguarding concern will vary and our expectations quite often vary. So if we receive a safeguarding concern from a professional, we would expect more information. Well, quite often we may get a referral that comes from uh, an individual's neighbour. And that person isn't going to know everything about that individual. What they want to tell us is they're a bit worried about somebody. And, and, and that's fine. So quite often part of that initial information gathering, which I'll talk about later, may be getting back to the referrer to ask for some more details because sometimes you, you might have missed something that to us is really important. Um, but generally, as a bit of a rule, these are the kind of things we would kind of look to if you were able to get them. But as I say, it may be that you don't automatically know them. So obviously a good starting point would be the individual's name. Telling us a bit, what, why are you worried about them? What, what is it that's leading you to either pick up that phone or do an email? What, what, what is it? And that may be, Later on, we discover actually everything's fine. You don't need to worry. But somehow it, it, it's got you to the point that you think you need to tell somebody about it. Their address. So we're able to kind of locate the individual. Sometimes that's not always easy because sometimes we get concerns that come in around people who don't have an address. Uh, sometimes the people may be sleeping rough and therefore we get a location, not so much an address. Their date of birth. And that, that's always a bit tricky. So sometimes for professionals, we might know the date of birth because they're, on, they're known to that, that uh, agency. But quite often people don't know the neighbours next their date of birth. So they're not going to know that. The contact number is really useful because that helps us then to we need to clarify any risks is to get back to the individual themselves. And any other information that uh, could help us to identify them. Details of their family, including any children under 18, if that's appropriate and details of the person you suspect may be mistreating or harming them. Could you, you may know that it may be, you have to give a description. But as I just said then, don't worry if you do not have, you know, if you don't have all the information, you should still report that concern to us. And then, <laughs> then we'll do the information gathering and fill some of the gaps where we're able to do it. Um, a big thing that comes up sometimes is, is that people want to remain anonymous. Because people don't always want to say, yeah, and it's me, um, I'm Bob's next door neighbour, <clears throat> but I'm really worried. <clears throat> and I'm upset because they're going to get upset if they know I've raised a concern. We will do our best to maintain anonymity of an individual wh wh where we're able to. I always say this, I can't give 100% guaranteed anonymity. You can't do that because there are occasions, either when that person will put two and two together, and quite rightly arrive at four <laughs> and go, I know where this has come from. Uh, but we will always endeavour where we're able to is, is, is be anonymous. So it might be part of our information gathering is to approach another agency that's already working to share that, those, those details. And it may be that's the way we get involved and we don't have to mention the person that's raised the concern with us. Um, but if we do have to share information around the person that's referred, we would always come back to you and let you know that. Um, okay. So the next one was what happens next? So I was asked to cover how you get in touch with us, um, um, that, what, what information we need, and then what happens next. So in terms of what we, we get, I haven't, I haven't made this too legally, too legally, because I could sit here and talk for the three hours on the CARE Act. But the CARE Act pretty much details nowadays what we do in relation to adult safeguarding. Because prior to the CARE Act, there, there was no legal grounds for adult safeguarding. And sometimes it could feel a little bit like the Wild West. You could go to a different borough. And before we had Pan London safeguarding arrangements, um, all boroughs did their own thing. That doesn't happen anymore. So we have the Pan London safeguarding arrangements with the sisters, 
and we have the Care Act, which sets out what our legal responsibilities and duties are. So what I'm going to focus on is when we get information, what we set about doing is, is quite straightforward, it's information gathering. So we make contact with the referrer to clarify information or fill in any information gaps. And we'll aim to do that within 24 hours, so within, within a day. We then set about information gathering, which will help us to make a decision as to the most appropriate and proportionate way to progress the concern. And this is likely to include contacting the person if safe to do so, because that part of the information is about saying, well, let's just gather some right information at the start so we don't just phone up Doris straight away going, hello, Doris, somebody says you're being abused. That, that's not how we would go about doing it. So we'd obviously then, we are able and safely able to contact the person we would find out what they what their views are on the concern around it. What would they like to happen? And do they need any support with that or any protection around that? But it might be protection or support to, to, to deal with that situation themselves. Establishing what they believe may make them safer. Sometimes people don't always know that because they don't know what the options are to make them feel safer. So part of that conversation would be around what's available. We'll try and reach an agreement about what needs to happen. And I would say probably 90% of the times we're able to do that. But there may be some times when the person says, I don't want you to do anything. And we're not confident in that person's ability to manage that situation. And that will comes on to mental capacity sometimes, but it might be we're, we're, we're not of the view that person is able to keep themselves safe. And therefore we may have to have a different protection plan that the person isn't automatically in, in agreement with. What we will do is make sure they're involved as much as possible in any decisions to protect them. Because it's important, safeguarding isn't a separate process, it's about working around the individual and what it is that they want and to make sure they're involved in it. So the, the, the formal phrase on the next slide, please. Yeah. So the, the, the phrase you'll often hear is cause inquiries to be made, which is in the CARE Act. So there's called, section 42 is, is the bit in the, 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 uh, the legal bit. There's a section 42 that, that places responsibilities on the local authority to cause inquiries to be made when a safeguarding concern is brought to their attention. And part of that is information gathering. <clears throat> Some of the considerations in that are a thing called making safeguarding personal. And what does the individual want to happen? I'm going to give you two very quick case studies which I think highlight these. And the Mental Capacity Act, which came out in 2005. And that is, relates to, is the person able to engage in the process and or protect themselves? And that's a separate session in itself. Also, the, the Care Act identifies who we would do safeguarding processes around. So it's not everybody. And the notion being not everybody is an adult at risk. Um, used to be the phrase vulnerable adults, and the, as um, Christine Clark clearly pointed out, we don't use that phrase anymore. It's, it's not the right phrase. So adult at risk. And we still talk adults that don't like being referred to as an adult at risk. You know, people are quite resilient in a number of ways. But not being an adult at risk. And an adult at risk is identified as somebody who, because of a, a range of uh, issues, might be disability, might be mental health, might be learning disability, arguably is not able to protect themselves because of those and is in need of care and support. Uh, that's, that, that, that's the legal bit. But to be very clear for us, if somebody's not regarded as an adult at risk, it wouldn't mean that our front door would say, thank you, good night, goodbye. They, they wouldn't do that. They would give uh, information and signpost around what would be available. So it might be that's a concern in relation to domestic abuse, but they may not be an adult at risk, but we would ensure that they were uh, forwarded to the domestic abuse intervention service, for example. So our front door teams know what's out there and will assist. So I've got two very, very quick uh, case studies, which I will whiz through because yes, I think- I would appreciate if it's very quick, John, because we may very have quick. some questions from the public. Okay. Thank you. So the self-neglect. So this is in relation to, uh, we've seen a few of these cases coming through um, as part of the pandemic. So people might not have been quite concerned, concerned about the neighbour before the pandemic. When the pandemic came along, what they realised that perhaps there was fewer people going in to that property. So we've had a number of these. So Mrs. F is referred to adult social, social care from a concerned neighbour who is struggling to provide informal care or support due to the escalating hoarding and squalor in the property. 
She's 84 and was widowed 10 years ago and is understood to be estranged from her three children. We were able to identify that Mrs F was not known to have social care, although she is a London Borough of Hackney tenant. By the neighbour, we arranged a visit to Mrs F, who initially um, was not receptive, as she believes that neighbour could continue to meet her needs, and then she agrees to an assessment to identify how we can help. What we were able to do that was through a number of visits, she eventually agreed to a, a deep cleanse and then a kind of monitoring provision on that. Well, this is one that I'm utterly convinced if it hadn't been for the pandemic, I don't think this would have come to our attention. And we've seen a number of those where we work with the individual to get a good outcome. The final one, that's a very quick well, that one, was relation to um, a, a, an older couple who, the, the wife had some um, issues around depression and the husband had, had dementia. So the wife was the primary carer for the husband. And for the most part, that works really well. But every once in a while, the wife would have a depressive episode which required her to go into hospital informally, generally for six, six to eight weeks. Ordinarily, the carer for that would then, the primary carer would become the daughter, as the only child. And that generally worked fine in those arrangements. However, on this one occasion, the wife had, had uh, she went into hospital, she gave the bank card to her daughter. When she came out six to eight weeks later, she discovered that several thousand pounds had been taken from her account. She told the social worker around this and the husband also had a social worker. So the two social workers got together and a little chat about what to do about it. One social worker was very clear, oh, we need to find the police, this is clearly theft. However, the other social worker was going, hang on a minute, we need to be applying making safeguarding personal here. So let's have a conversation with Doris around what she wants to happen. What Doris said was, I know who's taking it. I know it's my daughter. I'm disappointed that my daughter took it. But if I get the police involved, my daughter will not come see me anymore. And she won't bring the grandkids. And I love the grandkids. And it's the grandkids that make my day work for me because my husband doesn't often recognise me. So that for me would be really, really important. But I, I don't want my daughter to think nothing, nothing of it. But I'm also worried, she's saying about if I have to go into hospital again. So what she did is she made arrangements for her neighbour to look after a bank card if she needed to go into hospital again. And what we agreed is collaboratively that we would do a review of the husband's care and invite the daughter and talk very clearly about finance management in a way that supported the, the wife, but also told the daughter that, that we know what happened. And that was, was, was resolved. And the reason I use that as a case example is because before making safeguarding personal, I think we would have just jumped in there with our size nines and said, it's police matter, 999. But talking through the person around what they wanted to happen, what their thoughts were about a protection plan and assisting them to manage the situation worked out to have a much better outcome for her. And I raise that, so I think it's really important. Um, so that's me. Um, any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, very much appreciated. Yes, we open the meeting now for questions and answers. Jennifer, I can see that you want to ask your question. Please go ahead. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, John, I just wanted to ask, in regards to the um, case study that you um, just talked us through, um, I was just, it, was it I wanted to ask the person who lives in social housing and needed safeguarding support or intervention, would could would that same intervention be given to somebody who lived in private housing or similar? I'm not sure how that quite works. I'd be interested to hear how that would work. OK, uh, in theory, safeguarding applies to anybody, doesn't matter where you live. So the, the principles of adult, uh, adult safeguarding will always be the same. The issue might be if you're in a supported uh, accommodation, you might have a, an automatic network that becomes part of a protection plan. So if you're like in extra care or supported housing, quite often that, that comes with, with staffing. Whereas sometimes some private accommodation, it might be the arrangement might be commissioned differently. Is that what you meant? So you, sh you shouldn't really have it any different way where you live. If you're a Hackney resident, then, then we would be involved in adult safeguarding. You are on Jennifer. Yes, before, before we continue, and I'll see if, if there are other questions coming to you, um, 
John, but I guess this is for all the speakers, just to clarify. So safeguarding applies to only to adults at risk, which is people who have care needs, is that correct? Can we say that? Yeah, so care, care and support needs. Care, support, care and it, support needs. And importantly, it doesn't be, be, before the CARE Act, we had that, but the notion would be that you had to be in receipt of care. The CARE Act has said you have to care and support needs, but you don't necessarily need to be in receipt of, of a, a package of care. Right. Yeah. So as, as, as long as the person is at any kind of risk, the safeguarding will apply to them. It, in it terms of apply, but it also that other component, which means that they are unable to protect themselves. Yes. So quite often you may have somebody that perhaps has a physical disability, but they're more than able to manage their finances. Absolutely. I right. work with people who can tell you down to the penny. <laughs> There's no way that's going to happen. So you have to bear in mind what, what the safeguarding concern is and what the risk is in relation to that individual's ability to protect themselves. But I guess that the message here is really if we are in doubt, we better raise it rather than keep it for ourselves. Yeah, I think if there's one thing I hope you, you guys have all got today for me is if you've got a concern, share it share it we'll have a conversation about the best way forward and just not being an adult at risk doesn't mean we're going to say thank you good night nothing to do with those folks that that's not going to happen there'll be a conversation around what the most appropriate way forward is for that individual right thank you any other questions for any of the speakers today if not we received one questions, one question from a member of the public, and John, I already sent this to you, but I will just read it loud so everyone can yes. can uh, hear that. So the patient is with a brain injury and currently in a rehabilitation centre. He lives with his daughter against whom assault allegations have been made recently. A safeguarding concern has been raised that the patient will not be safe if he potentially gets discharged home. So the question is, what is the risk assessment made in this case? And if the patient is not going to be discharged home, where they will be? Okay. The, the first thing with this to say is the first driving factor would be the Mental Capacity Act. And the Mental Capacity Act 2005, is, it focuses upon people's ability to make decisions for themselves. We have a duty to assist that individual to understand information, to make sure information is an accessible format. Because that person in this scenario, the person would tell us what they think. And that person may say, I want to go back home. And I think my daughter's great, thanks. And you can all go off and leave me alone with it. So the conversation we would have then with the individual is to say, right, are you aware of the risks? What do you think the risks are? And what do you think your ability is to manage those risks? So that person may come forward with a really good protection plan for themselves. What they may say is, well, actually, I've got my other daughter moving in and they're going to keep an eye on her. <laughs> so actually, I feel safe and I'm OK with that arrangement. That individual may say, I don't know what you're talking about. My, my daughter's wonderful. There's never been any safeguarding concerns. And therefore, I don't need to think about protecting myself because that wouldn't, you know, it's never going to happen. That then for me would begin to question whether or not the individual has mental capacity to make that decision about keeping themselves safe. Then we're into what is called a best interests process within the Mental Capacity Act. In doing that, what we would always seek together is what that individual's views were before they'd lost mental capacity, because that's really important. How, how somebody lived their life before they were unable to make those decisions. How important were the relationships prior to that person losing mental capacity? All the people involved, we would approach what we call interested parties in making that best interest decision. So when it's deciding who would be the decision maker, I don't want to get too technical, but in terms of the decision maker around someone returning back to their home, might is likely to be the council, local authorities, social services in that scenario. So what we, we consult the clinical team because we might want to find out whether or not this individual is able to regain the mental capacity. And does the, is the decision, does it need to be made now? Interestingly, in the case note, it talks about the discharge at some point in the future. So my, why would we be making a decision now? 
that person may be better able to make their own decisions in six months time and then we'll wait for six months time and this person can tell us what they want to do themselves however if it's felt that person is unlikely to regain mental capacity then the best interest decisions will, will come into play about how we assist that person clearly looking to maintain relationships and to build um, independence and res resilience where that's appropriate for that individual Part of that discussion for me would also involve having a conversation with the daughter about what the daughter's views are around that. Because quite often people living together, can, it can be very tense. It can be very, very tense. And it's really important to find out actually are the ways we can make that better for people. So it may be a package of care, which makes that person less, um, less, less stressed out by feeling they're the only carer. So there's lots of different ways you can do. It might be that we look at an appointeeship regarding that person's finances. So the primary carer doesn't have the stress of managing the finances. So we can set that up. We can put a package of care which goes in to support somebody during that. Or the decision might be, no, actually going back to that accommodation isn't the best option for somebody. What we may look at doing then, I'm gonna get technical now, is look at an advocacy role. Because if that, if that person, for example, has got family and there's disagreements we, and they doesn't, doesn't have mental capacity to make their own decisions, we may engage a, an independent mental capacity advocate who may be in, involved in part of that process. But it's important to say one of the outcomes might be that this person doesn't return back to that home setting because that's felt to be in their best interests. And if they were, certainly in a residential setting, it may be then they're subject to deprivation of liberty safeguards authorization or liberty protection safeguards from next year, but that's another session. So what I would say is for me, it's never a cut and dried. And even if you did make a best interest decision for somebody, there's a clear expectation that, that, that you would review that and you would keep that open and make sure that the outcome you've arrived at is, is the most balanced and the least restrictive, because that, that will change in terms of someone's abilities or, or any deterioration. So I hope that that's answered that. I think, I hope it did. Uh, I'll have to go back to the, to the resident who raised that. Um, mm. I would also like to say, is the safeguarding team actually doing any follow-ups after the case has been resolved? We, we should, should mention that because the, the City and Hackney Safeguarding Adults Board at the moment is quite keen to get feedback in relation to adult safeguarding. There, there's, there's a constant issue. I think we're getting better at it. One is we were not always consistently getting back to the people making the referral. Um, and sometimes that's about we get we might respond back, but we, we can't tell that person everything. Around confidentiality, it wouldn't be appropriate to tell your neighbour everything about you. It wouldn't be right. I wouldn't be happy. <laughs> so it might be, well, what we're best able to do is say, look, thank you for the referral. Um, we will seek to progress it. And thank you for, for the information. If that's another professional, the intention is we will get back and say, thank you, we've got this. We may ask for some more information. And then we may involve that person in the safeguarding process if they're an interested party in that individual's life. We have a quality assurance component as part of adult safeguarding, which is, as I say, the outcomes for adult safeguarding have changed over the last years. I think the Care Act has done this. So a big focus for us is around whether, whether we've achieved the individual's desired outcomes. What is it they wanted to achieve from the safeguarding? And if that ultimately was to say, I want to feel safer, and because of our intervention, that person feels safer, then that's a good outcome for the individual. Our, our, our desired outcomes, sometimes that's completely met, sometimes that's partially met for an individual, but they're generally around the 80%. So we, we don't, don't do bad. But I think the bit for me is we're never going to achieve 100%. And this is where I do the, the as Elspeth said, this kind of participatory, <laughs> participatory bit. It's like, why is that? And because quite often it might be the safeguarding outcome that somebody wants is someone to be hung, drawn and quartered on, on the town hall steps because they feel so aggrieved by a situation, but we're, we're not gonna be able to achieve that for that person. So part of those conversations might be, right, these are the options we, we, we can 
arrive for you. So it may be that care worker is never going to darken your doorstep again. They're never going to knock on your door ever again. And that might be a good outcome because we can't guarantee the person's going to get fired. You know, we, we, we can't do that. But what the, the board is looking to do is identify people that have gone through that safeguarding process to get some qualitative feedback around, you know, was the process, was it um, person-centred? You know, did somebody talk through those outcomes for you? You know, did, did you feel protected? Or did you think it was actually it was a waste of time? <laughs> I'm not, I don't feel any safer. Uh, and they didn't include me in the process. So we, we are looking to, to do that. Um, and the safeguarding adults manager at the end of the process should be having that conversation with the individual around it. Right. And our safe, we have a very small safeguarding team. It's myself and two senior practitioners. And the, the two senior practitioners often work with more complex cases. But there are some where we will follow up, definitely, to make sure we've got the protection plan right. Right. Because sometimes you don't always get it right. And you might, this is the person that said this, and they might have told us that they're perfectly fine and able to do it. Mm. And then we get another safeguarding concern may come in in three months' time, which suggests that perhaps that person's ability to manage that situation is not quite as, as they thought it was. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, John. Any questions for... The speakers or we'll have to just um close the meeting very soon but yeah i can't see any question oh yes sorry um i can see Serge ahmed yeah um hi john this is a question for john i'm the development coordinator for the hacking lunch clubs network i'm just wondering generally how easy or difficult it is for uh, people whose um language is not first language is not english to access safeguarding issues is it fairly easy? Have you got things in place that can help people? people? Sorry, Very just good. excellent. Sorry, so what was that again? Oh. Yeah, I'm just wondering if uh, how difficult or easy it is for people to access uh, safeguarding sport if English is not their first language. Um, I I would say it's quite easy now. I think years ago it would have been a real nightmare. But I think nowadays we're able to uh, access language line, various interpreters, um, and quite often at short notice, I have to say. Um, obviously, we, we work with our, our commissioning because obviously for, um, as a local authority, you know, there are a number of people that speak different languages other than English. And therefore, part of me is ensuring the information is available in an accessible format. That's any information, not just saddle safeguarding. So we have, a, as, a, as a council, we have a duty to make sure that is available in loads of different languages. So we're certainly able to do that. And if there's something that we felt wasn't, was something might be a bit unique, we can always commission um, uh, agencies to, to provide information in that written format. Well, we don't always have, you won't have a go-to stock. There isn't a big stock room in Hackney Town Hall with every single language. So it would be uh, on particular requests, we can get that translated into a language. Uh, but interpreters, generally speaking, pretty available because they're, they work uh, across London. Right, excellent. And Shirley has a question, a very last question, Shirley, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, is um, adult social care in general and adult safeguarding in particular adequately staffed and resourced? My, my view would be yes. <laughs> it, it, it really? Would be... No staffing problems, recruitment and retention or all that? I, I think staffing and recruitment and retention, I think, is an issue across London. It most definitely is. And I think some of the challenges we have with that is in relation to when people leave. Obviously, people build relationships. And sometimes that can be a challenge when we have to transfer cases between, between people. Um, and sometimes there's a reliance, I think, sometimes on agency workers whilst we do that. But I'm not convinced that's all just, uh, and the reason I didn't en emphasise it specifically for Hackney is because I think it is a London issue and arguably a national issue. You're probably glad of my accent, I'm from Manchester. Uh, and some of my colleagues that work up in those areas have similar challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Christine, Elspeth or John, any final words before we 
we say thank you very much. No, it's just, to, it's just from my point of view, I have to go very soon. Um, it really is important. I think the whole slogan, we, we use it all the time, safeguarding is everyone's responsibility. Just be proactive, ensure that your management committees talk about safeguarding and that you create your own DNA to safeguarding. So if there's one action from this meeting is to think about it, whether you're a friend, family, neighbor, or you use any public provision or voluntary provision, just keep safeguarding on your mind. It really is important. There's legislation coming. Um, I'm abreast of legislation um, for organizations that work at an international level. Um, and uh, some of that legislation is going to apply to locally based organizations. So keep tuned in and just make sure that you keep reading links about safeguarding adults and children. That's my only tip, can I? Thank you, Christine. Thank you very much. Elspeth, any, so, John, Elspeth anything to add on this? Are you? Uh, just, uh, training, training, and more training. And uh, <laughs> yeah, everybody can get in touch with me either through uh, HPV or yourself scenario. Excellent. Well. I'll share your details with. Okay. Thank you. I'll share your details. Thank you very much. And John. Just very finally, if in doubt, start a conversation. There, there's, in my view, there's no such thing as a wrong referral. No, no such thing. You're concerned, start a conversation with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, Elspeth and Christine for the excellent uh, presentation and the information you shared and for to everyone who joined the meeting today. I really hope you find it useful and you got the message. Um, and I would like to use this opportunity to tell you about our July information exchange, which will be on the 27th of July and we'll be talking about food health. And also to let you know about the um, St. Leonard 3 development meeting that we will run online on 13th of July between 6.30 and 8 p.m. And I will share this, um, I'll share the joining links and, and the booking links with you after the meeting today. So um, again, thank you very much uh, for joining. Have a good afternoon and I'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.